Good evening or afternoon or morning, depending on where you're watching from. I'm Annie Stutzman, the Associate Director of the Windward Institute, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our webinar, Unsiloing Science, Connecting Schools and Literacy Researchers. I hope that you are ready to enjoy what is certain to be a lively discussion with these educational leaders. This past May, the WI hosted an online seminar with leading scientists dedicated to team translational science. The goal is to provide a roadmap for the science of reading and evidence-based reading practices to reach schools. We learned that barriers still exist to disseminating this science at every level. In each of tonight's panelists' work, they have served as leaders in navigating these challenges from science to education and across school contexts. Tonight, we will focus on answering this big question. How do we as educational leaders battle the barriers between research and practice and build bridges to disseminate evidence-based reading instruction at scale. We want you, the educators, administrators, practitioners, and families in the audience to participate in this ongoing conversation. We invite you to share your thoughts and inquiries with us to help us push the conversation forward post-event through communications with the Windward Institute, on social media, and by connecting with us through our newsletters and email all of which you can find more information about on our website, www.thewindwardschool.org slash WI. On to our distinguished panel. Akila Asqui is a core member of the Manhattan Literacy Academy team, whose expressed goal is to open the first DOE public school designed to educate children with language-based learning disabilities using evidence-based, explicit, systematic instruction using multi-sensory structured literacy. Through her experience in working with children with learning disabilities, anxiety, ADHD, low self-esteem, social isolation, her expertise provides the psychological, executive functioning, and SEL considerations that are needed for the creation of MLA. As an education advocate, she is a founding board member of the Dyslexia Alliance for Black Children, aimed to address how racism impacts the identification and treatment of dyslexia for children of color. She is also a founding board member for Families for Real Equity in Education, a nonprofit that serves to organize families living in New York City's Educational District 2 to advocate for racial integration of our schools and propose policies that create equity for all of our students. Akila is a graduate from Williams College with a BA in Psychology and earned her MA and PhD in clinical psychology from Long Island University with training in treating children, adolescents, and adults. Claudia Kuchek is the head of Westmark School in Encino, California, and serves as a mentor and resource to countless educators, professionals, and families in a career that spans over 30 years in the LD community. Claudia is the founding head of the Dyslexia Center at UCSF which is comprised of preeminent scientists who, along with renowned neuroscientists, geneticists, and clinicians, aim to eliminate the debilitating effects of developmental dyslexia while preserving and enhancing relative strengths of each individual. The center works closely with schools and educators to apply learnings from this unique program to develop early interventions and educational strategies for children with dyslexia throughout the country. During her 26 years as head of Charles Armstrong School in Northern California, Claudia received the City of Belmont's Diversity Award and was recognized as Educator of the Year by the Morrissey Compton Educational Center. In 2016, NCLD presented Claudia with the Bill Ellis Award for her work in demonstrating excellence in practice and commitment to all students. Claudia has served on the Board of Directors at Parent Education Network, Mid Peninsula High School, and Dyslexic Advantage. She continues her work with the National Center for Learning Disabilities as a member of their advisory board, the Dyslexia Center at UCSF, the Cedar School in Connecticut, and is chair of the Board of Directors and co-founder of the Diverse Learners Coalition, an organization aimed at providing legislative internship opportunities for young people who learn differently. Ben Powers serves as head of school at the Southport School, a leading day school for students with dyslexia and ADHD, and is founder and executive director of the Southport CoLab. 
He also serves as director of the Haskins Global Literacy Hub, is an affiliated research scientist at Haskins Labs, and is chair for scientific symposia at the Dyslexia Foundation. His research and professional interests include dyslexia, ADHD, and executive functions, building collaborative community partnerships to close the literacy gap, and opportunities to support the needs of diverse learners in the classroom. He also serves on the advisory boards of South by Southwest EDU, the Gemesee School, and Camp Spring Creek. He is an honorary board member of Smart Kids with Learning Disabilities, and he is the co-author of Great Expectations, A Current Perspective on Education, Disability, and Society, a chapter in the volume in All About Language, Science, Theory, and Practice. Jamie Williamson, moderator and panelist, joined the Windward School in July 2019. Prior to his arrival at Windward, he served as the head of school at Marburn Academy, a grade 1 through 12 day school program for students with learning differences in Columbus, Ohio, and as the principal at the Springer School and Center in Cincinnati, a grade 1 through 8 day school program for students with language-based learning disabilities. Mr. Williamson is a graduate of Western Kentucky University with a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology. He also holds a Master's of Science and an Education Specialist degree in School Psychology from Miami University. A licensed school psychologist, Mr. Williamson spent four years prior to his tenure at Springer as the school psychologist at Bridgerton Middle School in Cincinnati, Ohio. Mr. Williamson also previously served on the board of the Southwest Ohio School Psychology Association as the president and on the board of the Ohio Association of Independent Schools. Mr. Williamson is a passionate educational leader and steadfast advocate for children with 18 years of experience supporting families and children with learning disabilities. Throughout his career, he has been a standard bearer within schools for partnership and collaboration that seeks to empower students, families, faculty, and staff. And what better mindset to lead us into tonight's discussion than to hand it over to our moderator and advocate for building connections between siloed disciplines. Thank you again for taking the time to be with the Windward community. Jamie, thank you for leading this discussion. Enjoy. Thank you so much, Annie. And I just want to say a big sincere thank you to, to Claudia, Ben, and Akila for being here tonight. You know, there are a few perks to, to the job that I get to hold here. One is that I get to spend a lot of time with some really amazing, amazing educators. Claudia and Ben, I've had a chance to get to know you now for what, like the last five, six years, somewhere in that neighborhood, it feels like it's been, it's been a minute. You two have had such an impact on my growth and development and, and my career. Um, you've always been there when I've needed a good ear to chat about, to problem solve, to kind of think about, you know, where we're headed as a program, where I'm headed as, a, as an individual. And I just really appreciate all the great love and support you both have shown me over the last uh, last few years. In Aquila, I've had a chance to get to know you over the last year working on this partnership with MLA, and I've just been incredibly impressed with the passion and the dedication you bring to that project. So I'm, I'm, I feel like a kid in the candy store tonight. I'm just so excited to be here with all three of you. Um, you know, we've had conversations over the course of, of our time together uh, as, as friends and colleagues talking about how do we really tear down some silos? How do we get more folks uh, thinking about the science of reading? How do we get better ev evidence-based practice in schools? How do we get, you know, uh, uh, teacher training institutions working with schools? How do we get public schools working with private schools, researchers working with, with teachers? All these different kind of connections. And I think part of this conversation, building on the, the great work we, we discussed at the translational science piece, is really about tearing down some silos, reaching across different barriers, and finding some ways to work on some things. So I've got some questions, you know, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll launch into a question and maybe ask a, a one individual to kind of start the process with there. But please, Akila, Ben, Claudia, feel free. If I didn't start with you, please, please feel free to jump in and, and share your insights on this. But, but we'll, we'll pitch a, a question over here to Claudia to kind of kick us off. Um, you know, Claudia, you just such a such a well respected uh, you know school leader. It's it's just an honor and privilege to be sharing a kind of a, a virtual stage with you tonight. Um, but in your work as a school leader, if you think about some kind of key infrastructures and resources that you've really needed to help you kind of implement some of these ev these evidence based instructional practices, you know, what are some key things and takeaways that you you could sort of share with the group tonight about how to how to tear down some of those silos and begin that work. Thank you, and thank you, Jamie, for having me on this panel tonight with um, esteemed colleagues. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, comes to mind for me 
is that for many of us, even on this platform and people listening to us that have been very fortunate to work in environments where there is a significant commitment and commitment mm -hmm. that has been made to sustain scalable curriculum-based professional learning. And so we're very fortunate to have access to these resources. So I'm speaking to the, to the audience tonight that perhaps are thinking about how to do this, right? So beyond learning about the research behind the science of reading and including math, what does that mean to us? And that means, at least for me, is the time that um, I have devoted along with colleagues like all of you to professional collaboration. And I think that's a key component to really breaking the silos, right? Being able to collaborate, um, to find opportunities for coaching, for deep engagement, meaningful engagement by leadership, because it really has to start by the heads of schools, the principals, the superintendents, right? We are the ones who need to lead this, um, this, um, this vision, right? And coming together with people really knowledgeable about the curriculum. And that is when we are talking about the translational research and actually working with, with um, the, the STEAM research that we know that we have in the field. Um, to me, the work that I have done have been inspired by the fact that, you know, having been born and raised in El Salvador, being a person of color who actually understands the importance of bringing education to the forefront of underserved communities is critical to the advance of our community, right? So those pieces are really critical. So working towards creating a space, a movement, while I was talking earlier with your, with your team about, it's truly a call to action. So all disciplines, and that is psychology, psychiatry, at the mental health community in schools of education to come together and really start talking about the whole child. And that is the beginning of breaking these silos. Thank you so much. I don't know, Ben, Akila, anything else you want to add to that? Well, I'll just say, you know, I think um, Claudia, um, and again, Jamie, great to be here tonight. Thank you for having us and thank you to the Winward Institute. Claudia, I think captured it really well. You know, um, we can we can um, we can break these silos by finding opportunities to integrate, and I think that's exactly what Claudia does in her work. I mean, she's an integrator. She looks around um, and and identifies people who can contribute positively to the community and um, and accelerate you know the, the the student learning through advances in research and science. And um, and so it's uh, it's you know finding that integration is really critical. Thank you. Yeah, I can. Um... Thank you again, Jamie, for having having me, and it's lovely to be here and meet these amazing experts in this field. Um, you know, the silo that uh, my team and I are are trying to break into is is the public school system of New York mm -hmm. City. Um, so it is quite a large one, um, and it is one that has been resistant to research and resistant to um, those. Uh, in terms of reading instruction. And so really the way that our team has tackled it, and it's been really an amazing experience to be a part of, it is through partnerships and through connections, you know, along the, exactly what Claudia is saying, um, through the connections and partnering with people who are really immersed in their work and the expertise um, and bringing that into our model. So. Yes, thank you. Thank you. You know, I, I you know, Ben, I, I, I'll direct this next question here to you because I think in you, in your work, both in you know Southport and in the, in the Southport collab, you know, you've had you've been on the forefront of developing these really fruitful relationships and partnerships with researchers and institutions and your work at Haskins, but I also know you've done some re work within local public schools and under resourced communities. So how did you how did you really start the process of creating those partnerships in order to develop, kind of further translate research into practice in those spaces? Yeah, so, well, thanks for the question. It's a great question. You know, I, I think what we've all come to learn or understand is that the conversation we're having tonight, although we are we tend to be focused on kids with learning and attention issues, this is this is about all children. This is about equitable access to the printed word. You know, you you cannot function in society unless you are literate. And one of the most striking things to me was moving into the Southport community as a, as a, as a, a new to that community and turning and looking just two towns over and seeing Bridgeport, Connecticut, which is one of the top 50 worst cities in the United States in which to live. 
And so, you know, we recognize as a school community, we needed to do something to help Bridgeport. We needed to look at, you know, um, at those schools and identify opportunities to provide training, to provide professional development, but we didn't know how to do it. And so one of the kind of epiphanies, um, uh, you know, came from uh, Julie Washington and Nicole Patenteri. Uh, I met them in 2014, and they talked about the need to push into these communities, not to ask members of those communities to come out to our school in Southport, but actually to push in. But more important, they talked about being an active listener, being a really good listener. And you know, when we look at uh, education research, both have their strengths and both have their weaknesses. And one of the things we know from research in the field of research is that one of the weaknesses is that researchers tend to go into communities and you know, do short studies, maybe 10 to 12 mm -hmm. weeks, the typical kind of literacy studies, usually around three months max. So they go in, they provide great resources, maybe some professional development, they provide assessments for the kids and then they're gone. And so we saw this as a real translational opportunity to say, okay, that doesn't, ha it doesn't have to be that way, um, you know, but, you know, and it, and it also doesn't have to be totally separate, like schools, you know, two schools, even though they're just a few miles apart being completely separate. Um, so we saw the opportunity to do that. And, you know, I, I met uh, Nicole Patenteri and Julie Washington through the Dyslexia Foundation. And, um, and that is an, op that's a, an organization that brings researchers together with practitioners. And so, you know, becoming, uh, you know, becoming knowledgeable about how to actually think about how to go about doing this kind of work in those communities was really, really critical for success. But the most important thing, and I cannot stress this enough, most important is trust. Mm -hmm. you, you need to, you know, just like with our kids, you know, um, the kids who come into our schools, like we talk to talk to our teachers and and um, and our staff about you know needing to earn trust from these kids when they come into our schools because oftentimes trust has been broken. That's even more crucial when you're going into communities where trust has been broken again and again and again. And so, you know, being willing to make that um, you know that commitment, being patient about going in there, and then leveraging those resources. And I have to tell you, one of the most astounding things to me was um, you know talking to Julie Washington years later after we had been going into these schools and. Julie was like, wait, you, you did, you actually did that? And they're like, yeah, we're still there. And boy, did we listen. It took us a while to get off the ground, but now mm -hmm. we've been in these schools for um, almost uh, eight, eight years, I eight or nine years now. And, um, and, and the flip side of that was, you know, Julie was kind enough to kind of come out and give a talk about, you know, uh, effective literacy strategies. So there, there really are opportunities to bridge, uh, you know, some of these divides that just don't have to exist. Yeah. You know, Ben, I think you, you touched on a really inter interesting point. And when we had Nicole Pat and Terry on our last translational science uh, panel here, she talked about not your specific sort of uh, example, but the, the but the need for us to kind of go in, start the conversation, build some trust, and to really leverage that trust. I also think it's it's really challenging when an educational entity like a public school, New York City Public, public Schools, or Bridgeport Public Schools, or whatever system that you're looking at you know, when they don't see the need yet, you know, and I think that's also kind of a part of it because it's really hard for us to come in. And I think we have to be very careful to come in and, and bring too much sort of ivory tower feel to us, right? To kind of come coming into your community to bestow the knowledge upon you. Thank you very much. You know, uh, I think it can feel a little heavy handed. And so I think when, when, when school districts, you know, when you find the educational leaders, superintendents, principals, curriculum directors who are willing to engage the conversation, who see the need and leveraging that sort of that vision with them and kind of building something together. Because I, you know, in my work working in Columbus and in here in the city, New York City, uh, really trying to find someone to pave the way, trying to find, 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 find ways to pave the way for partnerships and collaboration. It's really kind of meeting people where they are and, and accepting them where they are and then working to help show them you know, where there's some, some different ways of doing things and where the research is really kind of guiding us. So, but I think the trust and that mutual respect is just a critical part of that. So thank you for that. Akila, Claudia, anything else you wanna add? Thank you. I would say that the work that you both are doing in these communities is incredible. I also think that it's important to continue to figure out ways that we can integrate the families. Because as mm -hmm. I said, you know, it's, it's every yeah. child. However, we also need to think about, we're doing the work in the schools with, 
with our children, right? Whether yeah. they are in our school or in other schools, but how do we engage the families? Because that is part of the translational research, right? How do we transfer this knowledge that mm -hmm. we're imparting to these students and we are inspiring them and we're helping them, we're saving lives, right? That's basically what we're doing. We're transforming their lives. So how are we also, for those of you who are listening, besides doing the work in these communities, how are we going to effectively engage families to support these efforts, right? And how we're gonna support literacy development at home and at school so it's transferable. The other piece is um, how are we going to continue, to, for example, which is something that I've been thinking about, how do we help families, how do we empower parents, right? To understand the desired outcomes for their children. How do we inform our parents about their involvement, how crucial that is. So that's another piece that I think is important, like Akila was gonna be working on as well with her, yeah. with, with your initiatives. And we'd love to hear yeah. your thoughts as to how you um, are planning on or envisioning this partnership also with parents. That's, uh, yeah. I was just gonna take over from there. Thanks. Please, yeah, please. <laughs> um, that is one of the key features that is something that our team has really tackled with Mm -hmm. um, in building this school, uh, you know, the majority of the members on our team are also parents of kids with dyslexia yeah. and have been through um, public school education where you are not given the information about your child to understand what's going on with them. So informing families, um, it's, it's also informing it's really informing everyone, parents, teachers, school leaders, everyone needs information in this, in this space. Um, but informing families is a big part of the work. It's also part of the work that I participate on in the um, Dyslexia Alliance for Black Children. That is actually specifically geared towards really developing a network in which parents um, are informed and understand you know, what their child's struggles are, what their child's learning needs are, what to ask for, how to ask for it, what's the, the vehicles in which you can, you, can, you can be an advocate for your child and be an informed advocate. Um, and in the planning of this school, um, you know, from the very beginning, mm -hmm. it is about really connecting with the students and the families. Um, in fact, part of the pilot that Winward and, and MLA are partnering on this summer is a, a piece of it that, you know, we spoke with, with the superintendent of uh, uh, where the school is housed is really having family feedback and really informing families um, mm -hmm. about their child's literacy skills, um, where their children are at. Um, it's, it's one of the things that you're really not given as a parent um, and that you don't and that you're not really, it's not fully explained. So that's a huge piece of the work is really that family facing um, information that needs to be crafted and delivered. Thank you, thank you so much. You know, I, and so I'm gonna sort of maybe stay on Akila for just a moment here with this next question, because I, I do wanna say a couple of things. One is that Akila, you know, and getting to know you and the, and the MLA team, um, I've just been so incredibly impressed by the passion that this group is bringing. And, and sometimes when I'm talking about passion, I like to make a real clear, critical clarification around what I, where I think passion comes from. I talk to our graduates about this. I talk to folks, kind of aspiring leaders about this. I think that people have a lot of misconceptions about where passion sort of locus to passion, right? So the idea that you're sort of, they have this thing in this world that you just love to do or kind of drives you forward. I think passion really comes from seeing the need in the world and having this kind of desire to fill that need. Right, it's it's a little bit different sort of low kind of center for me, and when I see this team from MLA and their passion for this work and seeing the need in New York City for a public uh, charter option for kids who are struggling to make sure that we're breaking down some barriers around equity and really providing a lot of great support for kids, research-based support for kids, um, and so as you as you think about that work. You know, how did how did you all come to uh, the team come to this idea to create and build a charter school here in the city really dedicated to kids with dyslexia? Walk us through where that kind of came from with you and your work. Thank you, Jamie. And I just wanted to just say that we're, we're actually attempting to build a DOE public school. So <laughs> not a charter school, um, a public school. And so how did we come there? Well, um, to 
of the, um, you know, we're all parents. All our, our entire team is a, a team of parents. <laughs> so, um, and we're all parents who have experienced having children with language-based learning disabilities. Um, before I was a parent, I've worked in this field for years and um, I've had training in doing neuropsychological evaluations on kids and diagnosing, you know, language-based learning disabilities and other kinds of learning disabilities in children. Um, and then I also worked, uh, just me personally, I worked in, um, in foster care settings and all kinds of settings dealing with children who are, who are uh, really not being identified and not getting what they need. Um, and so our team, we really came together and coalesced around seeing there was a tremendous need in our public school system for evidence-based instruction, seeing our children um, not being identified and not being um, given the, the interventions that they needed and seeing how hard that fight is for parents, how incredibly taxing and debilitating to families um, is the fight to get their children the intervention that they needed. Um, and in some cases, most cases, in fact, especially for families of color in the city, especially for low-income families, inaccessible. Mm -hmm. And so the question that our team tackled is, how can we deliver culturally responsive, evidence-based structured literacy in such a large system? Um, and that passion, you know, it came from the coalescing of the professional experience that each one of our members had and the personal experience with our own children and looking in our communities and seeing this need um, exponential, expo you know, just an exponential amount of need and saying this needs to be in the public school system. We can't silo this only in private school um, systems in the city, which in, in New York City is where it's at. So that's, mm -hmm. that's how the passion kind of the root of it for our team. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, you, you know, as I oh, was go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, can I just also comment? Yeah, please, on please. What you just said, Akila, because when you talk about um, kids in the foster system, I always think about their A score. You know, it's kind of like the adverse child experience, right? So the trauma that our students come into our educational settings with. And so being able to work with the students and being able to kind of peel those layers and then inform the parents and then bring the teachers along. It, it, that's love. Like you said, you know, inspiration, where does that come from? But that's truly what we do and what we love doing this. Mm -hmm. it's, it's extremely rewarding. It is. That, thank you so much. And I, and I so as, as we think about some of this work, I think public schools are, are a really great point of interface, you know, because I, I'm, I, I'm sometimes I jokingly say I'm a recovering school psychologist. Um, I had to spend a little time sort of, you know, working to kind of unlearn some of the things and the gatekeeper kind of mentality that's often prevalent in, the, in, in school psychology. And one of the things that really helped me get there was my training at Miami University around kind of the science practitioner model. And how do you always bring good data and research to what you do, whether you're working individually with a child, with a classroom, with a system? How are you testing, you know, a hypothesis? How are you gathering data? Are you kind of moving all this forward? And I think when I look at a lot of public school systems, you know, what I see is, is often a real lack of curiosity around data, around sort of programmatic sort of implementation. You know, they think someone else has kind of kind of done the science for them, right? They think someone else has done the research, done the dive on whatever program that the curriculum director bought. And the reality is those things aren't kind of, aren't, they aren't happening. So as you think about your individual experiences here, you know, where is there some opportunities within, you know, these systems, you know, to, to really kind of have some impact and bring some of those folks to the table a little bit more, maybe more openly, more more transparently about sort of what we're trying to accomplish here. Have you had any sort of successes in sort of, you know, kind of 
you know, really hitting at that district leadership level to bring folks to the table to get the superintendents and principals of the world to kind of see things just a little bit differently? Well, I was just going to um, and kind of uh, jump on what Akila was talking about in, in terms of advocacy and getting, you know, getting services for our kids. You know, part of this big challenge is that in, in a lot of ways, our public school system was built on a system of denial, denial mm -hmm. of services, right? And, um, you know, it wasn't really until Brown versus Board of Ed where parents with kids with disabilities actually saw an opportunity to advocate for these kids because what they did before and, you know, and continued for quite some time um, was that they disenfranchised kids with disabilities by putting them into, um, you know, literally just expelling them, removing them from school. They were under no obligation to provide any kind of service. So what, what at least my perspective over the last several years, and this is especially thanks to groups like Decoding Dyslexia, is there's, there's been a positive shift in at least thinking about or getting people to the table around this um, conversation around you know, literacy and being able to provide that to kids universally. Um, we're nowhere near close to that. I mean, you know, the fact that Akila has to, you know, and her team has to really build a program, a school, you know, an actual mm -hmm. school to do that. The fact that we still run schools like we do, um, you know, we're, we, we've got a long way to go, but there seems to be, you know, an opening here that just did not exist maybe even 10 or 15 years ago. And, you know, a lever into that opening is again, you know, being really good listeners. You know, public school leadership, they have a tremendous amount on their plate. You know, it's just a reality. Mm -hmm. They're dealing with, you know, a lot, you know, a lot of, a lot of different elements. Um, and, and at least one opportunity we've seen is to talk to district leaders and under, you know, work with them and understand, you know, where, where are your, where are the challenges? What is not working well? Um, and then, you know, finding opportunities to, to leverage things like the data they're already collecting, um, or maybe, you know, um, instead of like, you know, huge comprehensive training to begin with, you know, small, small drips, little dosages at first, to be able to help, you know, um, instead of saying, hey, you're doing this wrong, um, because we don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater, there are a, a lot of things that go well in public schools and in, in, uh, in certain circumstances. And so, you know, having those conversations, understanding what in each community, because every school, every school, even in the same district is different, you know, mm -hmm. um, having conver generating conversations like that to find that lever to be able to go in um, and open up and, and, um, and bring in and, and partner with people to be able to provide resources, training, um, support so that they can do a more effective job with the kids that they're working with. Thank you. I wanted to add to that um, and just kind of, you know, I'm thinking about, we have, we've had so many meetings with school leaders throughout the city. We've had so many meetings with, you know, veteran principals, um, superintendents, um, most of the superintendents of Manhattan we've met with and um, we're working with. Um, and I would say that most all of the people that we have met with will be able to recognize on some level these kids with language-based learning disabilities that are not getting it. Mm -hmm. um, one, you know, former principal, you know, didn't really fully you know, um, have a ground, a foundation in evidence-based instruction in, around reading. However, you know, she had, you know, she said in, in, one of, in one of our meetings that, you know, the teacher who had the OG training is like worth all of her teachers, right? And so she really recognized the value that was there. Um, but there is a, just a very large gap between recognizing the value of the mm -hmm. evidence-based reading intervention work and then operationally putting it in place, understanding the foundation of how children learn to read. All of that, there's just a very large training element that... Um, is missing and that's beyond the school systems it it seeps into our higher edu uh, centers for higher education um, and all of these discussions we've had with training programs in and around the country in new york city and around the country 
um, through multiple CUNY campuses. We've spoken to uh, Bank Street, um, you know, the Hills, uh, but just tons of places, North Carolina, all over the country. While there is a greater consensus that this type of instruction needs to be taught to teachers, it's not fully integrated into our training mm -hmm. systems either. And all of our, and so in, in, this, in New York City, we have a situation where students you know, te become teachers, teachers become principals, and principals are the instructional and school leaders of their public schools. Mm -hmm. So the germination of evidence-based instruction really must begin at the beginning of that process. And, you know, one of the, you know, approaches that our team has been talking about for a long time, but also really beginning to advocate to with, with superintendents is really the, the training piece for school leaders, not, not just the teachers, um, yeah. the, you know, but really having it, you know, top down and bottom up simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um, that's been the direction of our work, be, you know, because of all the reasons that we're saying here, you know, in this yeah. discussion. There's yeah, so well said, Akila. Yeah, I, I just want to um, add one thing to that. Uh, you know, one of the huge challenges is even when schools get great training in place, to Akila's point, if leadership isn't on board or if it changes, you can see that great training or those resources just be pulled right out the, you know, the next year. And so yeah. um, that's such a great point, Akila. Yeah. Thank you. I think that is this, um, as human beings, we tend to cling to what we know, right? And it takes a while to, um, to peel those old habits. So as you said at the beginning, Ben, go slow to go fast, right? And be good mm -hmm. listeners and try to continue to figure out ways to create horizontal alignment so that we can later build, you know, vertical alignment. Yeah. You know, and I, I think I would I would add to that because I, I, Claudia, I completely agree. I think that vertical alignment piece, I think they, I love your your top down, bottom up analogy, Akila. And I think having the leadership on board with this is just critical. And I know that, you know, Claudia and Ben, I'm, I'm guessing your experience has been much uh, similar to mine in terms of interviewing uh, pre-service teachers. You know, people come out of graduate school and sometimes really high powered graduate programs uh, with little to no. And sometimes those master's degrees will say reading specialist at the end of them. And they come out with little to no experience and or knowledge around the actual teaching of reading which is just really a travesty in and of itself. So I think that we have a lot of space to kind of work there. Um, but in a lot of conversations I've had with school leaders, I think one disconnect for, that I see happening frequently is that they kind of put this as a, as a special education problem. Well, this is just like 10%, 15% of my population. This is just for the dyslexics. No, 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 no. Like everybody else is doing fine. And, and you have to really spend some time unpacking that data to show you know, where, where all of this, all of our kids can be, can be positively impacted by, by actually effective instructional practices when it comes to reading. And I think that I was, I, I, I was I'm heading to a conference in, in, at AIM Academy, actually, in Philadelphia last year, um, and I was taking an Uber from the, the hotel to, to, to AIM. And I happened to be, uh, walked down to the lobby and there's um, Emily Hanford, who's looking for an Uber. So we shared an Uber over. And on the way over, we had this really interesting conversation about that fact is that, you know, as long as we are sort of making this kind of the, feel like this myopic issue of special education or just dyslexia, I think, I think it actually is sort of doing us a little bit of a disservice in the, in the, the dialogue at large in order to really move a school leader because they, they do what they will they will compartmentalize that data and say, oh yeah, I'm sure that would be great for this 10%, but that 10% is not the one that's killing me, right? On this other stuff, is other, all those other things are getting ahead to, to Ben's earlier point. The idea of, I mean, I, there's a reason I, I left public education. I love, I believe in public education. I love it. I'm, I vote for every levy that comes down the pike. I support my public district here, but the red tape and all the competing practices and, 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 and priorities in public school make this work a monumental, like this work for us in independent schools focused on this work, it's still a monumental effort, right? But that takes it to an incredibly more challenging and more complex level. So my hat's off to these folks, but, but I also think that we have to figure out how to frame this in a way that, that some of these leadership, these leaders, folks in leadership can actually hear the work 
you know, you do get some bright spots along the way, some people who want to lean in, who read a little bit, who accept, you know, this as something a little bit bigger, but I, I think that we have to do some work to get people to engage that. I was even really pleased in one of our recent conversations with the DOE, you know, she was like, I wish you would do something for my principals. And I was like, oh my God, yes, of course. I would love to sit down and have a conversation with you about how do we train your principals to do this work and think about how to, how to bring in the science of reading uh, into day-to-day -day practice. So I, I just, you know, one, I feel like we could have this conversation for, for hours. Um, and so I wanna make sure we, we make time for folks to kind of uh, bring in some questions here. Uh, so unless there's some final comments about this idea of really kind of unsiloing uh, this work here and really tearing down some barriers, reaching across uh, different uh, different constituencies to bring this work together, um, I would love to invite, uh, I think Danielle is going to be our moderator for some q and A. I um, would love to bring Danielle and uh, maybe Annie back on here. Um, I think I'm a, a minute or a few minutes just a little bit early on that. That's Normally okay. I go we have... over. So. <laughs> no, that's great. We, we actually have um, a, a few questions. It's always good to get to as many as possible. Okay. Um, so a, a lot of these will kind of be a little bit diving in deeper to um, some of the topics that were brought up um, during this discussion. And as Jamie said, I could sit here and listen for, you know, another two hours, but We'll be kind and let people enjoy their evenings. And Claudia actually has to get back to work because it's a different time in California. Um, so our first question is, as we heard tonight, you are all so dedicated to implementing and making the science of reading in schools sustainable. Um, for people who are maybe not as fortunate to work with you or in communities like yours, um, could each of you maybe share a perspective on what misconceptions or missteps school leaders may hold in investing in the science of reading and evidence-based reading instruction, perhaps beyond one of the initial and critical steps of buy-in. Yeah, yeah um, so one, one just kind of um, tangential point here is, um, you know, if, if you ask most people who did not have any difficulty learning to read how they learned to read, they probably can't <laughs> answer that question. And chances are, you know, um, the, the amount of school you need to go to to become, you know, a teacher and then, you know, a, a, a principal or a building leader, you know, chances are there's probably a relatively smaller percentage of people with, you know, language based learning disabilities in that group. So, you know, I, I think part of the problem is just lack of awareness around, you know, that there is a process to learning to read. And in fact, even kids who work through that process fairly effortlessly are still at a huge disadvantage because the way we teach literacy in this country does not prepare them for the textbook language they're going to encounter in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. So we're not even helping, you know, uh, uh, typical learners who are developing reading pretty, pretty well. We're not even helping them kind of get to that next, um, that next level. So, you know, there's there's definitely important work that needs to continue to happen around raising that level of awareness for sure. Healer, Claudia, or Jamie, do you have anything like to add on to that? I, I think that part of the, uh, in terms of the misconceptions, sometimes uh, different communities think that this is not their problem. Mm -hmm. And so I go back to that call for action, right? To look at policymakers, school leaders, and educators, and parents really come together because this is, we're fighting for our future, you know? And so this is something that we, we truly need to do. And it's not one person's problem, it's everyone's. And I think that there's that misconception that, oh, it's not my school, or these are not my students, or it's not my district, but it's everyone's responsibility. And I think that often educational leaders will point to the kids who were at the top of the class who are going to learn to read in spite of a teacher, yes. right? Mm -hmm. And they say, oh, the, our program's working. Look at all the great things that our program's doing. But there are the, there's some kids who may not be getting everything they need, but they but for them, it's just not enough of an impetus there, I think, sometimes to really drive that, that ball forward. I would also add to this, um, you know, in terms of missteps or misconceptions, you know, one of the, a lot of things that came up in, in our work is um, really a fundamental lack of understanding what dyslexia is. Um, you know, we've had principals 30 years tell us Oh, I've never had a kid with dyslexia in my school, right? Not one in 30 yeah. years, which is just not statistically possible. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and so 
in New York City, I think about five years ago, there was a law passed at the state level saying that you can no longer deny putting dyslexia on an IEP. It was, it was, they refused to actually put it on any child IEP for decades and decades. So we are only five years into that even being allowable, and it still rarely ever happens. So, you know, really identifying, and in our, in our team, we actually call it struggling readers, because identifying dyslexia has just been such a high bar that most communities cannot pass because it, it's too costly. Um, and it's, it's, not, it's not something that school psychologists in New York City are even trained really to do and, and be able to do that in public schools. So, um, you know, we, we use the terminology struggling readers, but I think that really building awareness and building in systems in which um, people who are struggling to read are identified for that problem and not identified as, as a behavioral problem or mm-hmm. emotionally disturbed or you know having all these other identifiers, but not the learning disability piece that just being totally overlooked. Um, you know, and I would also say that in New York City, one of the things we really contend with when we talk about dyslexia and the sort of misconceptions around it is that um, you know, that it's kind of like a white soccer mom uh, issue. Mm -hmm. And that is this huge misconception that just continues to really marginalize and hurt communities of color here and around the country. Um, And, you know, these are all things that are now really beginning to be addressed, but something that we really have to work on as a community. We continue to work on. Completely agree with you, Akila. And I think the other thing, you know, when I when I look at some of the things out in the community that try to kind of help lift up uh, and identify kids early, like response to intervention model, um, which I think had such promise and was so poorly implemented across, you know, the, the United States. There's a, there was a few pockets of, of good there. Um, but this idea of looking at it from a kind of a universal screening, and I remember that when we were, you know, uh, down in South Africa, Claudia, talking about this idea of seeing it from a public health perspective, you know, and really recognizing that this is about if, you know, if, if I had, a, you know, had a potential, a few markers for heart disease, you know, a medical professional would start treating me well before I ever have heart disease to make sure that I don't develop heart disease, right? We can see that sort of chain of, of custody around identifying that really early and how that process evolves and, and how that cuts down on the, the, from a data side of this, how that cuts on actual instances of, of heart disease. But where we're failing to kind of implement that it is really in, I think, uh, universally across our educational process where we could be identifying in kindergarten kids who are struggling with letter names or sounds or or hearing the first sound of of a word and kind of really being able to identify that. And then doing the great work to identify those kids as at risk, not diagnosing just yet, because that that is within the power of a school psychologist and the community to start that conversation to identify, look at your lowest quartile, provide some direct research-based interventions and, and start to move the process along. But what happens is old systems just get relabeled in, in the public school system and kids sort of churn in a space where they're not sort of moving up a process or just kind of not receiving really anything. And then next year, we'll start all over again. Next year, we'll re-identify your child as at risk and then we'll do nothing again and then second grade. And then the third grade, all of a sudden you have a disability and or fourth grade, you have a disability and you've waited four years to do anything about a really serious concern, so. Yeah. And Jamie, just to take that analogy a step further, which I think is a great analogy on the public health piece, um, that only works if you have health insurance, right? And yeah. um, mm-hmm. and, and so, and and I think that analogy kind of sticks that way too. That you know, yeah. uh, you know, in our in our mo- in our most affluent public schools in this country, the most yep. affluent, it's a it's difficult getting uh-huh. those services, right? And so, when we look at communities where you know they're so under resourced. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a huge lift. So you're absolutely right. Yeah. You know, thinking about this, um, and, and, um, and that model and partnering, you know, through the continuum from birth, you know, from birth to three preschool, you know, um, preschool readiness, doing those types of assessments. We, we need a lot more 
funding and we need a lot more support to be able to do those things so that everybody's um, yeah. has coverage, right? Yeah, I love I love that addition to that analogy, Ben. I want to hang on to that one. Thank you. <laughs> you know, it's bringing education and behavioral health together. And that's something that when you think about um, pre-med students, postdoc students, they don't necessarily have had the opportunity to, be, to understand the educational piece, right? Cognition, what does that mean to them? It doesn't mean much, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we're looking at the brain, but we're not really looking, they're looking at it from an anatomical perspective, but they're not looking at it from um, a systems approach. Right? Yeah. So dyslexia, it's not a learning, just a learning. And that's how it's, um, how it's identified and where it's identified, but it's a medical mm -hmm. issue that it needs to be addressed from the medical field. I always yeah. talk about schools like ours, like hospitals, because we're specialized, right? Mm -hmm. And so we, I talk about preventative medicine. In preventative mm -hmm. medicine, you put those mm -hmm. kind of systems in place. That's, that's what best practice is about, preventative medicine. Yeah, because otherwise your hospitals are overrun with people who are there for, you know, in the emergency room for a sore tooth or, you know, uh, a fever. So I think that, that's a great, I love, let's keep the, the medical analogies rolling. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so in, in talking about, you know, what, what came up a lot was these issues of equity. And I think, you know, during the pandemic, um, perhaps a very small silver lining, if we can call it that, is a lot of these issues were brought to the forefront. Do um, the panelists have any thought on, you know, if, if they see sort of as we reflect on this past school year and, and you know, the past, you know, school year and a half, actually, that um, virtual learning and how children had such difficulty accessing this and now we're coming back, do you think this will um, sort of put pressure on the pedal to really address um, implementing the science of reading in classrooms? Go, go ahead, you can start with you, Jamie. Oh, no, no, no. I've, I've got lots of feelings about this. So yeah. I'm gonna let somebody else go first. Um, sure, I'd love to go first on, um, you know, yes, you know, the pandemic, since the beginning of the pandemic, equity has been the forefront of conversation across every discipline in our lives. Um, and, you know, these problems were certainly all there before the pandemic, um, because they're systemic and structural, um, and, um, and actually come, I, I have, I come from a systems background as well. I had, I've had a lot of supervisors who are really into systems. <laughs> and so I have been, you know, kind of really immersed in that piece, in the equity piece, um, beyond just this area of evidence-based reading instruction, but in other areas as well. Um, one of the really, amazing things that has happened recently, it's actually out in California in the Oakland School District, is that the NAACP in leadership with Kareem Weaver, like brilliant work and actually one of the mentors of our, um, of our, of our team, he you know, published a petition in conjunction with 14 other amazing you know, organizations in the area that really called to task the entire school board in Oakland, California and said, listen, you're 60 up to 61% of black, uh, Latinx and um, Pacific Islander uh, communities in the area are multiple grade levels behind in reading. 75% um, uh, or more of these same groups in, in this public school system in California are at least one grade level behind in reading. Um, and if you compare them to the white students, they are 10% below grade level in, in reading and 90% not. So, you know, and one of the things, you know, this petition is incredible, but they're saying that you, the school board has approved, you know, all of the reading curriculum approved is not evidence-based. Mm -hmm. And this non-evidence-based reading instruction, non-evidence-based training that's happening in our school systems are creating massive inequities in the literacy abilities of children of color in our entire school system. So I just think that work is incredibly uh, informative to 
all you know educational districts throughout the country um, and really um, is a, a call to action for all of us to look at our school districts and really begin to look at this data you know in terms of who is being taught to read and write and develop high literacy skills and who isn't um, and it's and it's it he just you know the, the petition illustrates it so clearly um, and it and that's one of the foundational pieces of our school model and creating this school um, and in fact you know our full our full um, scale is actually uh, multiple schools uh, you know and having like a teaching fellowship and all kinds of things to address not just the children who need it now, but the systemic changes as well. Um, but really servicing kids at that intersection between race and income, mm -hmm. where you those children are not, you know, getting any access to structured literacy um, at all. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, creating partnerships and creating like on the ground in high needs communities um is the way that we're addressing this equity piece very head-on and intentionally like from the beginning of our of our work you know jamie i know we're coming up to the hour one of the things that in terms of the call to action and something to keep in mind that for those of you who are leaders in inspiring leaders in working with teachers we know that um a high percentage of teachers leave in their first three years uh, because they don't have the right mentorship support, right? Mm -hmm. So that's something that we need to focus on so then we can retain them because that's also part of the issue in the, in the school systems is the, the turnover, mm -hmm. right? And that's a financial model that we also have to get a handle of. So, mm -hmm. you know, a few years ago, and this is pre-pandemic, NCLD published some data around um, that on average school day, about 200 students with LD drop out. You know, we, mm -hmm. we cannot afford that. So, yeah. We got work to do. We certainly do. You know, and I and I also, you know, I think about not only the teacher turnover, but a lot of schools, the administrative turnover. You know, it's it is I, I you know, I've I've seen districts where every two years there was like a churn and you cannot even remotely begin to put down roots for a programmatic piece because right. If, if you have a res any, anybody, someone who's even close to resistor sitting in that room and teaching in that building, they're going to say, I'm just going to wait two years. I will drag my feet. I will wait two years. I will smile and nod in a meeting, and I will go on doing the thing that I'm doing because you will be gone before I will. And, and I think that's a really sad state of affairs. So I think we need to figure out how to bring some better stability to the process as well. Um, but, I, but I also think that we need to figure out how to, how to have an influx of, from a funding perspective, on and ways to kind of create some more resource for some of, these, some of these schools. You know, I know in Ohio, and I'm not as familiar with how, how the funding model works up here, but in Ohio, it was really about property taxes, which created these incredible lush oases in the suburbs for these teachers had everything they needed, you know, as many copies, as many books, you know, all, all everything that they, they could possibly want. And most of it was, sometimes it wasn't good stuff, but they had stuff. Whereas, you know, we were in Cincinnati Public Schools when my, 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 my kids first started in a little magnet program. And I remember getting an email from a teacher that said, this was maybe like in December, I've ran out of my copy allowance for the year. So we're just going to be um, emailing these things home for you. And I was like, this is December. Like, and this teacher can no longer make copies in this building. And I'm just thinking of like, you know, Claudia, ben, have, I have never been in a building where like the copier ran out or my ability to make a copy ran out. And I think those are some like hurdles that they, these schools are dealing with that until we find a better way to kind of fund and sort of develop these schools, I, I think we're, we're chasing or we're not only are we sort of, you know, not sort of able to engage the real problem here from an equity standpoint, but I just think it creates just a far more complex sort of uh, set of solutions we need to bring to the table, yeah. so. Yeah, just, just even thinking about, um you know, the fact that I think one thing we all learned to appreciate this year is how important teachers are, right? Yeah. Hopefully we did. And yet yeah. we saw teachers around this country totally ill-equipped to go into this school year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if that's how we're supporting our, our schools, our educators, our leaders in schools going in, in, in a pandemic, 
um, it's a reflection of how we're supporting them year over year. Yeah. It's no wonder why we have the outcomes we have in this country. Yeah, you're so right. And I think that we can put every every responsibility, every ounce on our teachers, right? Um, yeah. We need to help them enhance their pedagogy. We need to figure out ways to inspire them and develop learning, learning um, opportunities for them, right? Learning communities mm -hmm. so they can learn from each other. And I think that we need to incentivize and create that space and inspire them because yeah. they're doing doing a lot of work with very little resources. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one of the questions that, you know, really came up for myself and my circle of colleagues when this yeah. pandemic started. It really pulls the lens back and asks, asks us, what are the values? What are the educational values we hold as a country, not just as a community, not just as a city, not just as a state, but really as a country, um, are we putting a value on our public school system? Um, because, you know, what, from my vantage point, what I saw as a parent in New York City in the public school system and the private school system, I saw massive inequities just in being able to attend school five days a week. You know, we had private schools that were able to attend five days a week and public schools that you know, even kids with IEPs were only attending one or two days yeah. a week in person school. And it really bring, you know, it really focuses our question on equity as a, as a value, as a values mm -hmm. question. Thank you so much. I think that that may be our time tonight. Um, I don't know, I, Annie, before you close out, I just wanna say a couple of things. One is that I just so appreciate each of you taking the time uh, during summer here to spend, sit down and talk about how do we kind of expand this work, tear down some, some walls, build some bridges, and allow our kids, uh, all kids. I think one of the things that I just love about our, our vision at, at Windward is that, you know, we, be, we, we believe in a world where all students have the ability to, to unlock their, their potential, right, and achieve that unlimited potential. And for me, that, that phrase, all students, is just so important to kind of remember that we have, that this for me compels us. Um, to, and, and gives us a lot of responsibility in this work to kind of reach into communities, to kind of build partnerships. And I, you know, as I, as I say to my team frequently, this work is bigger than me. This work is bigger than any individual person on this panel tonight. This work is bigger than all of us. And it's going to take us all coming together, interlocking our hands. We're not going to sing Kumbaya maybe, but like we're going we're gonna to come together and do, and do some really good teamwork along the way to help support, lift up, and, and put aside any ego that we have on the table here to really lift up our kids. And I just think you three are a, a, a really incredible shining example of that work in our community. I am just honored to know each of you um, and even more honored to have a chance to call you all colleagues. And I just really appreciate you being here tonight. Uh, always a pleasure, always some fun. Um, and we'll have to, you know, we'll have to do this again sometime. Jamie, so thank, thank you. you for your leadership. Yes. Yeah. Thank oh, you. thank you. So much. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I get to, we, we get we get to have a lot of fun in our work. I think that you know I jokingly say you know being a head of school at a school like this is one of the best jobs on the planet. Um, we get to really empower kids. We get to empower teachers. We get to do a lot of fun stuff. Um, you know, get great partnerships in the community. Get to really extend our our footprint and make sure that more kids are getting what they need. So thank you all for that great support. So I'll turn it over to Annie as we close out the evening here. Yes, I don't think I could have said it better. Thank you all. Thank you for those who joined. Um, if your question did not get answered, I think you can tell that this is an ongoing conversation. So please continue to reach out to us, engage with us and our speakers and um, onward we go. And uh, thank you all again. I hope yeah, you all have a enjoy, nice evening. Enjoy your summers, get some rest and relaxation. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Good night. Thank you.